What's going on guys, Justin here, and I am bringing you our fourth example video following our course on abstract algebra. Now, today's example video is going to be all on dihedral groups, so with the introduction out of the way, let's go ahead and get into our first example. So for our first example, we wanna show that SR to the K, which is in the nth dihedral group, is of order two for all K greater than or equal to zero and less than or equal to N minus one. So let's go ahead and get into this example. Now this example isn't too difficult. We're just going to be using the commutation relation that we proved in the lecture video corresponding to this example video, which I should have linked above. So let's go ahead and write down what we're looking at here. So in order to prove that the order of S R to the K is two, we want to show that S R to the K squared is equal to the identity element E, but also that that is the smallest power of S R to the K that gives us the identity. So since S R to the K is not the identity element, its order is not one. So let's go ahead and check S R to the K squared. So let me go ahead and write that out. So we have S R to the K squared but that's the same thing as S R to the K S R to the K. Now we will use our commutation relationship to move this R to the K to the right hand side. And when we do that, we'll get S S and then we'll have R to the K and R to the N minus K. Well, once we combine those terms, we're going to get S squared times R well R to the K times R to the N minus K is just going to give us R to the N but we know that r to the n is equal to the identity element e, and so is s squared. So that will give us just the identity element e. And so that does it. We've shown all we need to show. We've shown that s r to the k squared is equal to the identity element, and that it is the smallest power of s r to the k that gives us the identity element. Great, so let's go ahead and get into the next example. So for our second example, we wanna show that the order of r to the k, which is in our nth dihedral group, is equal to n over the GCD of k and n. So before I get into this proof, I'm actually going to prove a lemma, which I'm going to use in order to prove this fact. So let me go ahead and write out that we are proving a lemma here first. So for our lemma, we are going to first suppose that we have R to the K is equal to the identity element. Well, from here, we're going to apply the division algorithm, which I'll just abbreviate DA to our K there. And so that means K will equal, well, let's see, we'll have N times Q, and then let's use a big R for the remainder since we're using little r here for the rotational element of the dihedral group. And with the division algorithm, we have the following inequality applied to our R and our N here. So we have that zero is less than or equal to R, which is strictly less than N. And so with that in mind, we can write the following equality. We'll have that E is equal to our R to the K and that will be equal to our r to the k replaced by what we've gotten from the division algorithm here. So that'll be r to the n q plus our big R, but that's gonna be equal to r to the n little q times r to the big R. But since we have a multiple of n there, that r to the q will just be equal to the identity element. So we'll have that is equal to e times r to the big R. Great. So from here, we want to use the definition of order as well as the knowledge that the order of our element little r here is equal to n. So applying the definition of order to this, we know that the smallest natural number m such that r to the m is equal to the identity element is n. And from that, we can conclude that our big R must be equal to zero. Great. So because our big R is equal to zero, we can conclude that our N must divide K because K is equal to N times Q. And that's the definition of divisibility being used there. And if N divides K, that means we can write K as a multiple of N. So we'll just write that as N S for some integer S. Great. And so let's go ahead and apply that to our R to the K now. So that'll give us R to the K is equal to R to the N times S, but that is just equal to by the rules of exponents that is just equal to R to the N to the S. But since R to the N is the identity element, that'll just give us the identity element to the S which is simply equal to the identity. So from all this, we can conclude the following relationship, which we will use in our proof. We conclude that R to the K is equal to E if and only if N divides K. Great, so with that lemma out of the way, let's go ahead and get into our proof. And so let's begin this proof by considering our element R to the K. So let's consider 
r to the k, which is an element of our nth dihedral group. And then we want to note the fact that we stated above. We want to note that the order of our element r is equal to n. And so if you'll recall, what we want to prove here is that the order of r to the k is equal to n over the GCD of k and n. So using the definition of order, that means what we want to find is the smallest power of r to the k that is equal to the identity element. So let's call that power of r to the k m. So we want to find the smallest natural number, like I said, let's call it m, such that the r to the k to the m is equal to the identity element e, where m is some natural number. Great. And in addition to that, we want to show that this m is equal to n over the GCD of k and n. Great. So let's go ahead and start by letting d equal the GCD of k and n. So we can do some shorthand instead of writing all that out every time. And so from here, we are going to apply our lemma to our r to the k to the m. So if r to the k m is equal to the identity element, then by our lemma, we know that n must divide our k m. So that means that n divides k m. And I'll just write up here that we're using our lemma. But if n divides k times m, that means that n over d will divide m times k over d. But now we want to very carefully use the definition of the GCD. So since our D is equal to the GCD of K and N, that means that N over D and K over D are relatively prime. So I'll go ahead and write that out, that they are relatively prime. But if they're relatively prime, that means that N over D will divide M times K over D if and only if n over d divides m. That's by using the definition of relatively prime. But the smallest m such that n over d divides m, so I'll go ahead and write that the smallest m such that n over d divides m is when m is equal to n over d. But what is n over d? n over d is equal to n over the GCD of our k and our n which is exactly what we wanted to show m was. So since m is equal to n over the GCD of k and n, and it is the smallest such m, that means that the order of our r to the k is equal to our m, which is equal to n over the GCD of our k and our n. Great, so let's go ahead and get to our next problem. So for this problem, we want to make a Cayley table for D4. And I went ahead and wrote the setup for this Cayley table here. So we have all of the elements of D4 written on the top and the side. And we are going to make a multiplication table of sorts for these operations. So the first row and column are really easy as we just have the identity. And the identity just returns the elements back as is. So let's go ahead and write that down. So we have R, R squared, R cubed, S, SR, SR squared, S R cubed, R R squared, R cubed, S S R, S R squared, and S R cubed. Great. So next we have R and R. Well, R and R is just R squared. Similarly, R and R squared is R cubed, and R and R cubed is the identity. Great. And then we have R and S, well that's just going to be SR. Then we have SR and R, that's going to be SR squared. Then SR squared and R is going to be SR cubed. And lastly, we have SR cubed and R, and that will just be equal to S. And when you're making these kind of tables, make sure that you have no repeated elements and you have every element represented in the table to make sure you did it right. So going on to the next one, we have R cubed, and then we'll have the identity element there because we have R and R cubed. And so for the rest of the ones in this row, I want to note that multiplying from the left by R is the same as multiplying from the right by R cubed. So that will mean that this first one is SR cubed. The next one will be S. And then we will have SR. And then finally, we will have SR squared. Great. So now let's go ahead and move on to the next one. So we have r squared and r squared that is simply equal to the identity. Then we have r squared and r to the third, which will just be equal to r. Then we have s and r squared, that'll just be s r squared. And then we have s r and r squared, that'll be s r cubed. Then we have s r squared and r squared, that'll just be equal to s. And then lastly, we have s r cubed times r squared, and that'll just be equal to s r. Great. 
And so just as I said before, I want to note that multiplying from the left by r squared in this case is exactly the same as multiplying from the right by r squared. So let's keep that in mind as we go through this. Well, r cubed times r squared is the same no matter how you arrange it. So that's just gonna be r to the fifth or just r. Then we have s and r squared, that's just going to be s r squared. And then we have s r, that's going to be s r cubed. And then s r squared will be just s. And then lastly, we have s r cubed, and that's going to be just s r. Great. And so moving on to the next one, we have r cubed and r cubed, that is going to be r squared. As we have r to the sixth, and r to the fourth will just give us the identity. Then we have s r cubed. Then we have s and r cubed, that'll give us s r cubed, as you might expect. Then we have s r and r cubed, that'll just give us s. Then we have s r squared and r cubed, that'll give us s r. And then lastly, we have s r cubed and s r cubed, that will give us s r squared. And then just as I have been doing, when you multiply from the left by r cubed, it is the same as multiplying from the right by r. So let's keep that in mind as we blast through these. So that'll give us s r for this first one, s r squared for the next one, and then we'll have s r cubed, and finally just s for this last one. Great. And so let's move into our last four by four grid here. So S and S will just give us the identity element there. Then we have S and S R, and we wanna move that R to the right so that it'll be multiplying by R cubed on the right. So our S's will cancel out and we'll just be left with an R cubed here. Then for our S R squared, the same logic will apply. We wanna move our R squared to the right of our S, which will just give us an R squared. And then finally, by the exact same logic, we will have an R for this last one. Great. And so moving on to the rows, these are the easy ones now. So we have S times SR, the S's will just give us the identity and we'll be left with R, R squared and R cubed. So moving into our three by three now, we have SR and SR. Commuting that R over to the right hand side will give us R times R cubed, which is just equal to the identity. And on the left, we'll have two S's, so this will be equal to the identity. And then we have SR squared times SR. Well, that'll just give us R cubed. And then lastly, we have SR cubed and SR. Well, commuting that over will just give us an R squared. Great. And then the row for this one will have SR and SR squared. Well, we want to commute that R over, so that'll just give us an R here. And then we'll have SR and SR cubed. That'll just give us an R squared. Great. And so now we're down to our last four squares here. We have SR squared and SR squared. Well, that's just going to give us the identity once again. Then we have SR cubed and SR squared, and that's just going to give us R cubed. And then we have SR squared and SR cubed, and that's going to give us an R. And then for the very last square, we do not have an identity element in this row or column, so we can see that this will just be the identity which makes sense because if we commute the r cubed to the right hand side, it'll just be an r and we'll have s squared and r to the fourth, which is the identity. So that finishes this problem off and let's get into some examples where we look at different shapes. So for this one, we want to find the symmetry group of a non-square rhombus. So let me go ahead and draw a non-square rhombus as well as the operations on it. And then maybe we can fill out a Cayley table to see what's going on with this shape. So for our non-square rhombus, we have the following operations. We have a rotation by 180 degrees, as well as reflections on the vertical and horizontal axes. So let's go ahead and quickly fill out a Cayley table here. So we can quite easily fill out our identities here. So we'll have E, R, H, V, and R, H, and V. Great. Next, we have two rotations by 180 degrees, which will just be equal to the identity element there. And next, we have a horizontal flip as well as a 180 degree rotation. Well, if we do a horizontal flip, we will be switching our B and our D. And then if we do a 180 degree rotation, our D and our B will be in the right place once again, but our A and our C will be swapped. What? But what's swapping our A and our C? That is the same as a vertical flip. And then very similarly, when we do a vertical flip, we will be swapping our A and our C. And then when we do a 180 degree rotation, our A and our C will be back in the right spots, but our B and our D will be flipped, which is the same thing as a horizontal rotation. 
Similarly, here we have a 180 degree rotation in a horizontal flip. Well, that'll do the same thing as the horizontal flip in the rotation did. When we do our rotation, our A and C will flip, but so will our B and D. And then when we do our horizontal flip, we will put our B and our D back where they should be, which is the same thing as doing a vertical flip. So that's a vertical here. And similarly, when we do a rotation, like I said, we swap A and C and B and D. And then when we do a vertical reflection, we will only be swapping our A and our C. So that puts our A and our C back where they're supposed to be, but our B and our D are still in the wrong spot, which gives us a horizontal reflection there. So then we have two horizontal reflections here. Well, that's obviously going to be the identity as if you mirror it and then mirror it again, you will get the same thing that you started with. And then for the next one, we have a vertical reflection as well as a horizontal reflection. But if we do our vertical reflection, we swap our A and our C. And if we do a horizontal reflection, we swap our B and our D, but that is the same as just a rotation. Great. And similarly for our row there, we will have a horizontal reflection and then a vertical reflection. But when we do our horizontal reflection, we'll swap our B and our D. And when we do our vertical reflection, we will swap our A and our C. And since they're all swapped, that is the same as a rotation. And lastly, if we do two vertical reflections, we will just get back to where we started, which is the identity. Great. So let's go ahead and get to our last problem where we look at the symmetry group of a standard parallelogram. So like I said, here we are, we are going to find the symmetry group of a parallelogram that is neither a rectangle nor a rhombus. So just like I did before, I'm going to go ahead and draw you a picture of that parallelogram as well as fill out a Cayley table to finish this video off. So here are the operations for a neither rectangle nor rhombus parallelogram. We do not have any reflections, we just have a rotation by 180 degrees, which makes this Cayley table rather straightforward to do. So we can just fill out the identity elements right away, and then we are done. So let's go ahead and fill out the identity. We have E, R, and R. And then if we rotate it twice by 180 degrees, we have rotated at 360 degrees, and we are back to where we started, which gives us the identity once more. So that finishes this problem off, and that's a good place to stop.